Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Well, today we're going to be bringing you the Court of Last Resort. The Court of Last Resort was a real organization. It was founded by Earl Stanley Gardner, the creator of Perry Mason, and he wrote about it in a book entitled The Court of Last Resort. We'll talk more about it after the episode, but suffice to say this was a real organization. Uh, Today's episode originally aired December 20th, 1957, Season 1, Episode 12, and the title is The John Smith Case. It is you, the people, who are the court of last resort. According to the case for the prosecution, this is what happened in this tenement district of a large eastern city at 4.30 p.m., August 20th, 1935. This man, John Smith, was arrested, tried, and convicted of murder. He was sentenced to prison for life. But was he guilty? He swore he was not. For 22 years, he protested his innocence. He had no knowledge of where to turn for help. Even now, he had no idea that a hope awaited him. The court of last resort. Court of Last Resort is actually at work today, investigating cases throughout the United States. Its board of investigators, a group of seven men, experts in law and criminology, bound together in their dedication to improving the administration of justice. It was quite by accident that the Court of Last Resort heard of the John Smith case. I was visiting with Warden Sherman Avery on another matter when... Yes, what is it? Number 42961 is asked to see you, Warden. Who is that? His name is John Smith. What's he want? He says he saved enough money to buy the transcript of his trial. He wants your advice on how to proceed with an appeal. I'll see him. Send in his files and have him brought up in half an hour. Yes, sir. Stick around, Sam. You may be interested in this case. Sentence for life for shooting a grocer during a holdup. Ardle prisoner. Some trouble when he first came in here, but then settled down to the routine. Does his work well, never complains, hasn't been involved in any trouble since. John Smith. Nothing too unusual about that. No. The strange thing is, he's never had a visitor. Never gotten even one piece of mail in all the time he's been here. Boy, he's really the forgotten man. Have you ever thought what it would be like to be completely alone in the world? Yes, I guess we all have. In a nightmare, if at no other time. Uh, 
Thank you for seeing me, Warden. It's all right, John. This is Sam Larson. We've just been discussing your case. Hello, John. Sit down. I guess they told you why I wanted to see you, Warden. I heard you wanted to appeal. Yes, sir. I saved my money, and I want to buy... I want to know how to buy this transcript I need. I was told that's what I have to do. Who told you all this? Little Catalina. Who? I don't know his real name. I was in a cell with him a long time ago. We called him Little Catalina because he was from out on the coast. Just what did he tell you, John? He said I could get another trial and prove I didn't do it. But to appeal, I had to buy what, what you call this uh, transcript. He said it was a write-up of all the things that happened at the trial. When were you in with Catalina? Second year I came here. And it took you all this time? Some fellas here got friends or folks that send them a little money for cigarettes or candy. I earned it from them. I, I sure hope I got enough. I got $150. My trial was real short, so that should be enough. Don't you think? There isn't going to be an appeal, John. The laws of this state say you must appeal not later than three months after the date of your conviction. You're 22 years too late. Thank you, Warden. I should have asked a little sooner. I guess. Will you talk to him, Sam? <laughs> Warden, what could I say to him now? His only chance lies in a reinvestigation of the facts of his case. Your group is set up to do the job. I wish you'd try. Do you have any real indication that he might be innocent? No, but would a man spend 20 years saving pennies for his transcript if he were guilty? No. Sit down, please. Why do you want to see me, Mr. Larson? John, I just want to talk things over with you. Maybe let you get a few things off your chest. But why should you care? You don't know me. I know that you're John Smith. That's just the name I always used. I don't know my real name. Mr. Nobody, I guess. Why don't you know your real name? My mama died when I was little. I never had no papa that I know of. I started using John Smith because there was a lot of them. It made me feel kind of safe. You know, like I had a great big family. Mm -hmm. Well, the warden told me a little about you, John, but I'd like to hear the rest of your story. Are you a lawyer? No, I'm an investigator. From the police? No. From a group of men who want to see justice done. What do you want to know, Mr. Larson? Just what happened to you. Why you're here. I was here from New Mexico. I came up here just drifting around looking for work. I had about 16 cents in my pocket. I met another fellow who was hungry. So we I went into this little store. I bought a loaf of bread and a can of beans. We ate it under a bridge because a little rain came up. Later that night, the police picked me up. Said I killed the man in the store. They made me stand trial. <laughs> Here I am. What happened at the trial? It was over so quickly. I didn't know what was happening. I don't understand much about these things. I, I only went to the fifth grade. Go on. Well, I, I didn't have any money for a lawyer. So the court gave me this fellow, my, my counsel, they called him. But I guess he was too busy. Because I didn't talk to him until the trial started. Anyhow, he sat down next to me. He asked me my name, looked at my confession. And told me to plead guilty. He'd ask for mercy. So I did. I didn't know what else to plead when the judge asked me. Then they said, prison 
for life. The policeman who took me away said I was lucky not to get hanged. <laughs> Sometimes I'm not so sure. Well, now, wait a minute. You said that the lawyer, the court appointed to defend you, looked at your confession. Yes. Why did you confess if you weren't guilty? The detective knew some funny tricks. If you keep a man awake long enough, if you hate him enough, if you keep telling him he's guilty, he's a murderer, you keep doing that for long enough. He made me glad to confess. Well, why would he want to torture you into confessing something you hadn't done? He must have been crazy in a terrible way. I guess he hated me. And maybe he thought I, I did kill the man. I don't know. At first, I used to dream I was killing the detective and taking days to do it. But that's no good. It only made me worse than him. John, I'm sure you know that all policemen aren't like that. I know. When I was on the drift, I met quite a few, and they were all good to me. Told me where to get a bed or a meal. And even in jail, most of the cops were okay, too. I was just unlucky to have that detective get hold of me. Well, couldn't you have told the court what had been done to you? Maybe I could. But I didn't know how to go about it. I was dumb. I was scared. The only time I stood up in the trial, I tried to say anything. They told me I was out of order. They put me out of order for a long time. Now, look, John. Warden Avery here likes you. He says that your attitude and behavior have been excellent. You grow older. You learn. No use to fight the system. No use to hate the cops. They didn't put me here. They're only doing their job. Well, at first, I was a tough boy. I had a big chip on my shoulder. I was in solitary twice. The first six months I was here... It took me a little while to get straightened out. Then, after they put me in with little Catalina, I had something to work for. Can you help me? I don't know, John. I really don't know. I had been thinking about John Smith ever since my interview with him at the prison. I couldn't forget the face of a man who for 22 years, completely cut off from help or friendship, had never ceased to believe in truth and justice. I have several long-distance numbers here I'd like to reach. Can you set up a conference call for me, please? Thank you. I'd like to have them all on at once, if that's possible. Yes, all right, here are the names and numbers. It's a strange and complex civilization we've created for ourselves, and sometimes it makes problems for all of us. But other times, let's us put out a lifeline into different times and different climates. At Earl Stanley Gardner's ranch in California, it was a warm afternoon with pale gold sunlight streaming in. Dr. Lemoyne Snyder was visiting with Gardner in his study discussing the chances of their favorite football team. Outside Park Street's window in Texas, a light rain was falling. Park had been busy preparing a law brief for one of his clients. In Michigan, a cold front off the Great Lakes was dropping snow flurries around the homes of Alex Gregory and Marshall Houts. Alex was relaxing at the end of the day with a Brahms symphony on the phonograph. Marshall Houts was just preparing to go to dinner with friends. In New York, the lights of the city were glowing through a light fog off the Atlantic. Harry Steger was deeply involved in a chess game with a very tough opponent, Raymond Schindler. 
From all these different places, different conditions, different lives, the answer is the same. We must give help in any way we can. It was agreed to investigate the John Smith case at once. Last Resort swung into full action on the case of John Smith, with each member putting his specialized talent to work. Alex Gregory administered a lie detector test to Smith, not only to verify his story, but to try to uncover information which might help to unravel the case. All right, ready to start now. Did you enter the store where the man was killed? Yes. Did you see anyone else in the store at the time? No. Did you have a revolver with you when you went into the store? No, sir. Marshal Houts flew to the city where Smith was convicted. He contacted the court clerk and ordered a copy of the trial transcript so long desired by Smith. He paid for this, had copies made, and they were sent to each member of the Court of Last Resort for analysis of the evidence and conduct of the case. The prosecution's case is built mainly on the wife's identification of Smith. We've got to start with her. It would help if we could uncover this other drifter Smith says was with him. It's his only alibi. We'll get Ray Schindler and Harry Steger busy on those two angles. Meantime, Larson can try the detective who got the confession. Good. The sooner the better. Tomorrow morning's edition, if you can. We need all the coverage we can get. Yeah, I'm calling everybody I know on the publishing business. It's a good feature story, and it's mighty important. The man has been in prison for 22 years, and we've got to find the one person who really knows what happened. The only way we can do that is by taking the case directly to the people. Can I help you? I'm looking for a Mrs. Martha Raggio, who used to own this store. Raggio? Yes, her husband was killed here almost 23 years ago. Do you know her? You a cop? Well, my name is Raymond Schindler. I'm a private investigator. Yeah, I remember something about that. I think she moved away just after that. I got out the Smith files right after your call, Mr. Larson. The detective sergeant in charge of the case was Clint Morello. I'd like to talk to Morello personally, if I may, Captain. So let me know when you find him. I've got a couple of things I'd like to say to him myself. You mean he's no longer with the force? Clint Morello was brought up before the Internal Affairs Division in uh, February 1940. He was found guilty and discharged as being morally unfit for duty. Any idea where he might be now? Well, I've inquired around the department. He didn't leave any friends around here. Last anyone knows, he's working as an oiler on a freighter on a banana run. Is there anyone here on the force who might know about the Smith case? No, I don't think so. Uh, Jack Conlon was the officer that worked under him on the case. Jack was killed in a warehouse job four years ago. If this Morello pulled at anything rotten, Jack had nothing to do with it. Conlon was the one that brought him in on charges. Were there any charges of brutality against Morello? Yes, there were three complaints filed, all before the end of the investigation. Uh, nothing on the Smith case, though. No one squawked on that one. There was nobody around to squawk. Nobody knew him. Nobody cared. I don't know this, Smith. But let me say this. It doesn't give a good cop any pleasure to think that the wrong man's in jail. I'll open the department files, Amarillo, if you think it'll help. It sure will. Twenty-two years. It's a terrible long time. Yeah. Thanks again, Captain. All right, All right fellas. Others, let's look into this John Smith case. We've all seen Sam Lawson's report. Let's see what we can add to that. Now, uh, would you like to start, Dre? Well, I finally located Martha Raggio three days ago, up in New Hampshire, where she's living with her second husband. She admits that when the shooting occurred, she never saw more than the rapidly retreating back of a killer. Well, they had Smith turn and run from her several times. Finally, she said, he runs like the same man. Didn't she realize what she was doing? Well, she was ignorant, confused. Her husband was dead and she wanted someone to blame. Smith's build matched and this Detective Morello convinced her that he was guilty. Alex, what about the polygraph test? Well, Smith's story checked out in every detail. He told the truth straight down the line when he talked to Sam. Could you jaw the name of that other drifter 
out of him. I couldn't get any reaction from him on any of the names I tried. He, he doesn't remember or else he never knew. I have some good news on that point, Earl. Our newspaper campaign paid off. The man's name is Carl Holstad. He read about the case and wrote to me. He'll testify that he waited outside the store for Smith and that no shooting occurred at that time. You think this Holstead is reliable? He owns a hardware firm now. I checked him out. Good standing in the community. Why didn't he come forward at the time of Smith's trial? He and Smith split up before the police grabbed Smith. Halstead never knew. What's our next step? I suggest we take our case to the governor. That's a good idea. Good idea. An appointment was made with the governor's pardon secretary. And Carl Holstad was flown in to personally give his testimony. You've done a very thorough job of presenting the case in favor of John Smith. But it all hinges on one thing. That's your story, Mr. Halstead. I'd like to ask a few questions. Well, go right ahead. All this happened a long time ago. It was just one afternoon with no special significance for you. How can you claim to remember it so clearly? Well, it uh, wasn't just any old afternoon. It was a very special day in my life, my birthday. I was 22 years old and down and out. Maybe you don't know what that feels like. No, I don't. Well, I hadn't had a job in months. I was dead broke. Every time I stood up, I got dizzy from weakness. I give my right arm for a good meal. And I met this smith in a hobo jungle. He bought a can of beans and a loaf of bread, and he shared them with me. Half and half. How can you be sure Smith didn't go back to the store after he left you? Well, they tell me uh, that the grocer was killed at 4.30. And uh, Smith and I split up at uh, 7 that night in the freight yard. I hopped a northbound freight, and uh, he was headed west. I guess he never caught that train. You wonder how I can remember him. I wonder how I could ever forget him. I'll make an appointment for you to see the governor. Thank you, sir. You sent for me, Warden? That's right, John. John, there's some people here I'd like you to meet. This is the board of investigators of the Court of Last Resort. Now, Alex Gregory, you know, of course. Sorry, just let do, Mr. Gregory. Marshall House. Park Street Jr. John. Raymond Schindler. Dr. You're a free man. Why should you do this for me? Well, you did it for yourself, John. I, I don't understand. You helped a man who had less than you had 22 years ago. that job? I could use you, John. Maybe later. I, I just want to look around and see what's been happening since. I just want to look around. Well, uh, just remember it's there. You know, whenever you need it. Thank you, Carl. You don't know how much. It's okay. I didn't do anything. American Airlines flight to via New York International Airport. I can't take this, Carl. I mean, five hundred dollars. Sure you can. That's just a loan. You can send it to me anytime. I could give you an IOU. Oh, who needs it? We're friends, aren't we?
Welcome back. Well, a very solid story. I kind of wish this were longer myself, because it would have been great to see more detail of how the investigation played out. Because it felt like a lot got summarized due to the challenge of the one-half-hour format. But still, it's incredible to see this uh, big team just go to work for this friendless prisoner. And it's moving to see his reaction to being cleared, and maybe more than anything else, just actually being uh, cared about. And also just some great poetic justice where his own act of kindness so many years before was ultimately what saved him and gave him a friend on the outside. The basic story is true, though I think some details may have been embellished. Someone online pointed out that if John Smith really had been raised in an orphanage, that he would have had a name because that was something the orphanages were required to do. So it may have been a case for just not caring for the name he was given. The beginning of the Court of Last Resort in real life was in 1945, when Gardner cleared a man who was falsely accused of rape and murder. And that case started him out on the path to forming this court of incredible experts who, as this episode showed, could achieve amazing things. All right, well, that's all for this week. Join us back here next time for another episode of Public Domain Video Theater. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. And if you like these videos, you can become one of our patrons at patreon.com slash radiodetectives.